All this is Dr. Moveen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. The discussion today, we are going to talk about two studies uh, about vitamin C and D by our own soybean, Dr. Paul Marek and his team, and one more study about vitamin C, high dose vitamin C given as an IV to COVID-19 patients. Uh, just a heads up that both of those studies are lacking in significance. However, it is interesting. Today, I wanted to show these studies to make sure that we can uh, actually be a little more um, educated about how to look at studies and their data and how to interpret that. So with this, I'm going to actually start with uh, the a small article, a small blog post that I saw about the P values and kind of present to you that how does if p-value is greater than 0.05, how do various statisticians or researchers try to make it look significant? And the outcome I, I would like to have is that if you can register this, that p-value greater than 0.05 is actually not the best uh, p-value, or it is an indicator that the data or outcome is not significant. So let's start. So here we are, uh, the, the very first thing, what can you say where when your p-value is greater than 0.05? It is kind of a uh, funny uh, blog post, but very informative as well. So I'm not minimizing it, but just keep this in mind that when p-value is 0.05, that means that the data is not significant. And now let's see how people react to it and how they try to show that it is significant. So I, I'm gonna go, directly down here where he has given a few examples of various data points where the p was greater than 0 0.05 so someone in their statistics had p value of 0 0.08 so that is greater than 0 0.05 that means insignificant and how did they articulate that a certain trend towards significance a certain trend towards significance okay P is 0 0.07, once again, greater than 0 0.05, not significant. The narration was approached the borderline of significance. P is lesser than 0 0.07 at the margin of statistical significance. So I, I hope you're catching the, the drift here that when the P is at the cutoff point of 0 0.05 and it is greater than that, in all cases, we should just simply say that it is not significant. But then researchers try to kind of make it still look better or relevant. This kind of data should be discarded that, all right, it doesn't make sense. Just leave it alone. But look at this, P equals 0 0.055, close to being statistically significant. P equals 0 0.12 fell just short of statistical significance. I, I love these. I wish I, I could come up with these statements as well. P equals 0 0.086, just very slightly missed the significance level. 0 0.086, 0 0.18, way beyond 0 0.05, near marginal significance. P equals 0 0.0738, only slightly non-significant. P equals 0 0.073, provisionally significant and i love this one p equals 0 0.099 quasi significant and i loved the response he the comment he wrote he wrote i'm not sure what quasi quasi significant is even supposed to mean but it sounds quasi important <laughs> so if it is not significant then it is not important as well so uh, the the reason that i brought it up was that as you look at the data with me for the next two studies, please look at, be careful, be vigilant about the p-values there uh, and not just the outcome. So the first one here, this is serum levels of vitamin C and vitamin D in cohort of clinically ill COVID-19 patients of a North American community hospital intensive care unit in May 2020, a pilot study. Pilot normally should give you this clue that it is a small study. And if you see here, the doctors here, Christian Aventi, 
or Eventy, yes, Maharaja Maharaj Singh and Dr. Paul E. Marik, our own soybean. So I'm going to show you how this study is. And uh, again, maybe I should spill the beans right in the beginning that not significant, but let's see. So this is the study. And this is not to make slight of the importance of vitamin C. This is just to say that the data is not there. Although vitamin C is very, very important, we've been talking about it. So it's a pilot study, small study. It measured vitamin C and vitamin D levels. So the patients who were hospitalized, they and they were in the ICU. In this study, small study, they took their serum with vitamin C level and D level and tried to make, uh, tried to interpret them that is there a correlation to the mortality in those patients. So the size was small, nine, n equals 21, so 21 people, May 2020. In these folks, there were 15 males, six females, and again, out of those 21, 17 were Hispanics, four were, four were Caucasians. So this was the breakdown. 10 died. Again, this is a study that was done on the hospitalized ICU patients. So of course, the mortality is a little high in there. So 10 patients died. Now, what this saw was that vitamin C and vitamin D serum levels were low in old age and old age and lower levels of vitamin C appeared codependent risk factors for mortality. So if you see here, the wording is very interesting, although it is important what they're saying, but the wording is appeared. They are not saying it is significantly related. The reason for that is that the data does not show significance. And then uh, insulin resistance and obesity was also prevalent in this cohort. And here is what they're saying, that the normal levels of vitamin C are 17 to 154 micromole per liter in their hospitals labs. And normal levels for vitamin D are 30 to 100 nanogram per milliliter. So this is the data. So if you look at this data or these wordings, you would start suspecting that this may not be a significant, uh, this may not be a study with significant outcome. So let's look at that study for a second. So, so here is the study and I'm gonna go to the important points in here. So first of all, the biological culprit behind the risk of vitamin C deficit deficiency is the human species maladaptive evolutionary mutation of losing its ability to synthesize vitamin C endogenously. So one comment they're making, and again, uh, to all those who believe, who do not believe in evolution, this over here, we're just talking a study. This is not my own opinion, or this is not a belief system that I am preaching here. It says that in this study, they're saying that as we evolved, our body forgot to make our own vitamin C. Because of that, we are more prone to having lower levels of vitamin C. There is evidence association associating low body reserves of vitamin C and vitamin D with relative immune deficit and higher risk of infections. So we know that as well. So they are, they are uh, referring some studies over here. Then if you see here, we used age and serum. So I'm reading from here. We used age and serum vitamin C levels as predictors of mortality in three separate regression models. And if you see here, look at this age at the top. Age appeared to be a predictor of mortality from COVID-19 every 10 years increase in age increased risk of death 2.7 fold. And now let's look at their data. Odds ratio 2.7, so 2.7 folds. 95% confidence interval is 1.01 to 5.1. So this CI is already crossing unity, meaning one is involved. One normally means both sides are equal. Because of that, this becomes insignificant. The p-value is 0 0.0474, which is significant. When these two data points are taken together, then the result becomes less significant or non-significant. And because of that, you would actually see in this study that they would talk about 
it is not a significant study but we still it still helps us raise some questions that can be explored with larger studies so they're saying hey we are piloting something we are kind of indicating something maybe we need to go down this route to to research more so i want to go here to just let's look at some of the numbers overall correlation coefficient between age and vitamin c level was minus 0.2531 p equals 0.2 so again this 0.2 p is greater than 0.05 so again not significant and they're saying it here i've highlighted it none of the above correlation coefficients were statistically significant so they're, they're admitting that it's i'm not faulting them i'm just uh, with you working right now to see those studies where data may not be significant and how to how to find that uh, data then look at the survivors correlation coefficient between age and vitamin c level was minus 0 0.1954 p equals 0 0.5885 so again not significant not non survivors correlational coefficient between age and vitamin c level was 0 0.16 P equals 0 0.6. So once again, not significant. So then what is the use of this? So once again, I may be wasting your time today. But what I wanted was we have done about 200 topics now. And it seemed like that we have gone so deep into this system and the, the COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 and the mechanics and the drugs that I think it is interesting for us to kind of go a little deeper to understand the the papers as well and the data in there and kind of try to see how the researchers narrate them. And I think this is only possible that once we have looked at so many topics together that we are ready to go a little more deeper. So my apologies if it is wasting your time. Uh, my apologies, just give me today's 15, 20 minutes uh, for my sake and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so in other words, so the, here is a conclusion they're making. In other words, age without filtering out the effect of serum vitamin C level, both age and vitamin C were contributing to mortality, was a significant predictor of mortality. So they're saying that age alone was predictor. But when we add vitamin C levels as well, then it becomes insignificant, uh, which is interesting, right? Because it becomes insignificant. And so then they raise a few questions. Let's look at how they narrate it, how the data is not significant. Let's see what, what do they say. They are saying serum levels of vitamin C and vitamin D2 and D3 were low in most patients of our, our cohort compared with the normal ranges in our hospital lab and vitamin. So th that's it. That's the result. So again, not much. However, they do have a set of questions that I thought were interesting. So let's look at these. So because they, they realized that these, the outcome was not significant, here is what they're saying. The findings of our small pilot study might generate hypothesis and contribute in impetus for further therapeutic intervention studies. So what are the questions? So check these questions out. I like the questions. Number one, should those at risk for a newly diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 infection have their serum vitamin C and vitamin D levels measured and started on preemptive supplementation to lower risk of COVID-19 and severe forms? I think that the answer to this question should be yes. So they're saying we should do more research to find the answer to this, but this study raises that question. Should those infected with SARS-CoV-2 and with additional risk factors, the elderly, diabetics, and obese, or obese receive rapid and higher dose replacement or, and supplementation of vitamin C and vitamin D to lower risk of COVID-19 and severe forms. Again, my answer will be yes. And they are raising this question. They're saying, fine, our data is not significant, but the data that we're seeing is telling us to do some more research for these kind of questions. Should those with severe or critical COVID-19 and whose critical illness might impair the enteral absorption of vitamin C, enteral absorption means from the GIT, and vitamin D receive urgent parenteral high dose replacement and supplementation of vitamin C, meaning parenteral is other than the GIT, other than the oral, for example, infusion or injections. So these are interesting questions that this study is raising. Although the reason I wanted to show it to you was 
the data structure to look at how, when data is not significant, how is that used in research? Now I'm going to go to the second study. The second study is here. So this is a study. I'm going to show you the link as well. This is a link. It is a preprint, so it's not in an accepted study. It is still under commentary. And in my opinion, the study I'm going to show you now is actually a poor study. And once again, let's see if we can find out what is poor in this. The study is pilot trial of high dose vitamin C in critically ill COVID-19 patients. So that is a study. And here is what they did. What they did was it is actually a randomized study. It is controlled study. It was done in Hubei, China. So in one group of patients, they gave 12 gram of vitamin C per 50 milliliter. So that is how much vitamin C they gave or administered every 12 hours for seven days at the rate of 12 milliliter per hour. So they took 50 milliliter. In those 50 milliliter, there was 12 gram of vitamin C, 12 gram of vitamin C. So it's a high dose. And this was an infusion. Now the placebo group or control group was simply given water, but in the same manner. Now, what were their objectives? Their study objective was that they wanted to see that when they give high dose vitamin C, can that reduce intensive mechanical ventilation? So can the patient stay intensive mechanical ventilation free at the day 28? So they wanted to see if the patients would not go on a ventilator for 28 days. That was their primary goal. And they did not meet that goal. The second, secondary goal was if the patient would die or if they would go under organ failure because of COVID or if their inflammation would progress. And here is the interesting thing to look over here. Death is a variable which cannot be monitored over time. Death just occurs. So it is a zero or one. It is now or not. So it is a variable. You cannot kind of look at the trend of it. So when we are looking at some drugs, it is interesting to look at those variables for which you can see the trend. So as you are administering the drug, you can see that if it is making a difference over time or not. So death is, of course, important to see that something can significantly reduce it. But the other variables which can be monitored are also very important. So Keep an eye on those variables here. So study is 54 people, so small study. It is a trial that was stopped, but because it did not have more people, that is a flaw in the study or a weakness in the study. And they say that they did not meet their primary endpoint. Now let's look at what they had in here for our ease, because once again, the data is kind of um, put in a way that it looks funny. So for our ease, I have put red and green markers on data point to say this data is OK, this data is not OK. So the mechanical ventilation free 28 days, high dose vitamin C patients 26.5 days, placebo 10.5 days. However, hold on, the P is 0.56. So even when you look at this data, you might say, all right, these folks were 26.5 days. These are 10 days. So there is a difference between them. But the maybe the number is so small that the P is just not significant here. And similarly, if you look at their confidence interval, that is minus 2.3 to 11.9. So not significant. As soon as it crosses one, it makes both harms equal to each other. Or you can say we cannot look at this data to say it is significant. Then if you look at their uh, partial pressure of oxygen and the fraction of oxygen, so that is one of the measures. Uh, normally, lesser than 300 becomes an issue. So 229 in the patients who were receiving I, uh, vitamin C IV and 151 in the patients who were receiving placebo. So that is actually very good that, hey, the folks who were receiving vitamin C, their oxygen saturation started improving. On the other hand, those who were not receiving it, they were not improving. 
the p value is good as well p is 0 0.01 lesser than 0 0.05 is it lesser than 0 0.05 and then the confidence interval 33 to 122 that once again is way beyond one so not significant sofa score sofa score is the score for the criticality of the patient and then 28 day mortality here the sofa score itself changed from 3.5 to 3 so higher sofa score means more ill patient and more chances of their death lower sofa score means improved patient to lower chances of death so if you see here the sofa score improved in the patient with the iv vitamin c from 3.5 to 3 so that is an improvement on the other hand placebo sofa score went from 2 to 6 so that is a deterioration and here the p value 0 0.05 which is significant so this is the first piece of significant data in this study that the 28 day mortality in more severe patients who were receiving vitamin c they improved so this is uh, an important uh, so this is the first piece of important data uh, arun is saying what is p and ci uh, a long discussion and uh, in medicine we used to do those as separate topics as well p is called the power of the study the smaller this number the more powerful the study is and what does that mean what that means is let's say the p is 0 0.001 what that means is that the, the result that we are seeing there is one in 1,000 chance of that result occurring randomly instead of the intervention we are giving. So let's say you're, you, you have a bunch of people. There are some in control and some are in intervention. Let's say vitamin C. And you are observing them and you're administering vitamin C. And at the end of the day, there is a result. If the P is less than 0 0.001, that means that the chances for that result to just randomly occur with or without vitamin C is one in 1000. So the smaller the p-value, the better it is. The confidence interval, on the other hand, is the 95% confidence that in the community, this data would repeat. Because the study sizes are small, uh, I'm kind of making it simple. Uh, because the study size is small, you have to take that small sample and then extrapolate that over the community. So how do you do that? You create two boundaries, lower boundary and upper boundary. As long as those boundaries are lesser than one, that means that the intervention group has become significantly better than the non-intervention group. So th these are roughly uh, the ideas for P and CI. So um, SOFA score, that was a good one. Interleukin-6 at day seven. So interleukin-6 is a marker for inflammation inflammation so as inflammation is occurring they were monitoring interleukin 6 and seeing what is happening to it and they saw that in the patients receiving inter, uh, vitamin c the score was 19.42 so it was down while the patients who were on placebo their il6 was increasing so that was 158 now look at the p value 0 0.04 so good it is lesser than 0 0.05 and if you look at the confidence interval that is also both numbers are in minus so none of them reached positive so that is significant as well so this means that vitamin c actually helped keep the inflammation in control then again sofa score greater than three that means more critically ill patients their mortality they didn't give the numbers here but the P is 0 0.03 and the uh, confidence interval is 0 0.06 to 0 0.9, which is lesser than one. So that means there was a significant difference produced here as well. So from this study, as much as I would call this a poor study and the data is less significant, but there are still two interesting things to check here. One, those patients who are becoming more severe in them when vitamin C high dose infusion is given, their mortality is reduced, number one, and number two, their progression in severity is reduced. So of course, that is a good thing. So um, now I'm going to go and look at this data with you.
So this is the study, high dose vitamin C infusion for the treatment of critically ill COVID-19 patients. And here is what they dose. I have mentioned it before. So 12 gram of vitamin C. Then if I go down here, there's a lot of discussion. I want to show you these. Adverse events is important. So what happens? What were the side effects of high dose vitamin C? They observed nausea, vomiting, electrolyte disturbance, kidney injury, acute kidney injury. If any adverse events were observed in HDIVC patients, drug infusion was stopped and patient was removed from the study. So that was an interesting thing that kidney damage could occur with high dose vitamin C. And then if you look at their primary outcome, check this out here. I have presented that data before, but looking at it here as well, look at the P, P equals 0 0.56. Hazard ratio is 4.8. Minus 2.3, confidence interval 211.9. So that crosses unity, not significant. P is greater than 0 0.05, not significant. So we leave that. Then we go to the secondary outcome. And once again, if you read it, you would see similar results here as well that I have put there. So um, what is their basic uh, message here? So there is an improvement in some areas which are significantly improved. And they're important areas as well, mortality and the inflammation's progression. So what do they say? They say, in addition, this study was consistent with other studies that showed the protective role of vitamin C infusion in acute lung injury and ARDS. So that is a general statement that they feel has become true or verified with the study. And then they talk about the weakness in their study. The first weakness is that they had to stop the trial. Second weakness is that the vitamin C occurred more than 10 days after the symptoms. So when the symptoms started and the patient came to hospital, there were 10 days about that or more. And so then the vitamin C was started. So they were unable to see that if vitamin C was started early on, what would have happened? Then SARS-CoV-2 infection was characterized by mild symptoms initially, followed one week later by a rapid deterioration leading to hospitalization, and ARDS always occurred at the day eight after the symptoms. So this is also an interesting point they're making, that acute respiratory disease, usually at the time that the patient is in the hospital, from there eight days later, it occurs. So that is kind of, that gives us an idea of what happens with the patient's progression. So conclusion, in summary, we found that the addition of HDIVC may provide a protective clinical effect without any adverse events in critically ill patients with COVID-19. So look, they did not say it significantly help. The narration is may provide a protective clinical effect. HDIVC provided one of the alternative treatment options as there was no effective drug or treatment to cure COVID-19 at the present. Nevertheless, further studies are needed. So I would not agree with this statement that it provides an alternative treatment option. I think it is a great supplement. It is a great support, but it is not really a treatment. Meaning if you say, all right, just give um, high dose vitamin C and that is sufficient because we don't have other therapeutic drugs that I would not agree with. So this is the discussion. Today's discussion, I think that you might fault me for picking up two studies that were not significant, but I wanted to kind of look at that data together as well and prepare us to look at more studies because studies are coming in every day now and kind of make our own opinion and look at the data as well. So that is the discussion for today. Thank you very much for your time. Please do me a favor, like, subscribe, and share. If you wanted to support this work, there is a link in the description for donations as well. And I would see you tomorrow.